G'day guys and welcome to our lesson on circular motion centripetal acceleration. In the other video we did on circular motion, the very basic one, when we discussed speed, velocity and acceleration, we ascertained that if you have an object moving around in a circle at a constant speed, like a car here, as it's moving around the circle, although the speed is constant, the size of that yellow arrow is constant, the velocity is always changing because velocity takes into account the direction. And in order to change a velocity, you need an acceleration. And what we ascertained was that the acceleration is directed towards the center of that circle. So if, and that must be also where the force is directed. Now, if we know the velocity of this, of this moving object, say a car, and we know the radius of this circle, it's a bad place to put it, I'll put it here. Then it turns out we can find the exact theoretical magnitude and direction of the acceleration. So the acceleration's direction is this way, but the magnitude can be figured out according to this formula up here. The centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared over the radius of the circle there. So let's solve a simple example. Say there's a car going around a roundabout and the speed is equal to 20 meters per second. And the radius of this roundabout is 10 meters. It's a very large one. The centripetal acceleration is given by the speed squared divided by R, which comes to 20 squared divided by 10 which is 40, and the units for acceleration is meters per second squared, because of course, oh actually that's a bit tricky, yeah, meters per second squared. We can also use the centripetal acceleration to describe obje objects that might not be moving in a complete circle, but only part of a circle. So let's look here at a plane, moving in a loop. Okay. Let's say this plane has moved down in a huge loop and it's just coming to the bottom there. And the radius of the loop, if we could describe the loop in full, the radius is 100 meters. And the velocity, or say the speed, the speed of the plane down here is equal to 40 meters per second. So 100 meters radius, 40 meters per second speed, and we know that the centripetal acceleration here, this is what we want to find, is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius. So that's 40 squared divided by 100, which is 1,600 divided by 100, which comes to 16 meters per second squared. So although the plane is moving faster here, than the car, since the radius of the turn is so large, the acceleration it, it is experiencing is actually much, much smaller. And this kind of reasoning, you find it, you, you can figure it out when you solve questions, but always remember, it's visible in the formula. Looking up here, the centripetal acceleration is going to go up if the velocity goes up, because both terms are on top. If we increase the radius, as we did down here, well, we're dividing by a bigger number. So this technically becomes a smaller term. Therefore, the centripetal acceleration goes down. They, the acceleration and the radius are inversely proportional. You may be wondering why I've got this formula up here. We discussed in the, lesson, uh, the previous lesson Velocity and the period have a relationship that follows this. So velocity is equal to 2 pi r, the distance around the outside of the circle, over the time it takes to complete one loop around the circle. And also, the period there is equal to 2 pi r on v. So I'll put a dotted line there, don't confuse them. This is the same thing as this, just rearranged. So let's see if we use that logic if we can rearrange our first formula at the top there, a, uh, the centripetal acceleration equals v squared on r, 
to get this. So we said V is equal to 2 pi R on T. So we know the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared on R. I'll be careful not to confuse my R's and V. So that's the R, which is equal to, well, V equals 2 pi R on T. So 2 pi R on T squared divided by R, which comes to 2 squared is 4. Actually, we'll write this out long way. So 2 squared times pi squared times R squared all over T squared times R squared. Whoops, no, that's just R. So let's see what we can cancel down. Well, we can divide this R squared by R to make it just R, and the bottom by the same to make it 1. So it becomes 4 there. Pi squared R on T squared. So both these formulae are related through this little relationship here. And that's where it comes from. Let's try solving a centripetal acceleration problem using this formula here. I'll draw another circle just under here. Whoops, what was that? Delete. Okay. New ellipse. When you see a roulette ball, roll around a table once. Let's assume it doesn't lose much speed in that single roll. There we go. Uh, uh, the radius of a roulette table, I think, can be about 0 0.3 meters. That's the radius. And the time it takes for a ball to go around, we'll say it's going very slowly, it's 2 seconds. If this ball truly is moving around this circle at a constant vo uh, speed, almost said velocity there, that's a bit tricky, at a constant speed, it must be experiencing acceleration in this direction. Let's use this formula to figure out the magnitude of that acceleration. AC is equal to 4 pi squared R, that's 0 0.3, over T squared t equals 2, so that's 2 squared, and that comes to 2.96, sorry, roundabout approximately, meters per second squared. So we don't actually need to know the speed of whatever's moving in a circle. We can also just use the period. So now we've discussed centripetal acceleration. Hopefully you understand those two formulae and how to use them. Let's talk about centripetal force. And this is incredibly simple. We know that this relationship comes from Newton's second law, F equals m a. So for centripetal acceleration, the force towards the center of the circle that's moving the object in a circle is equal to m v squared on r, which is just this term with little m in front of it, which is equal to we can put the m in front, I'd prefer to put it later, 4 pi squared r times m on t squared, which is the same as putting an m in front of it, but for simplicity's sake, we'll put it back there. So to figure out the force that's being applied to something, all you've got to, need to, all you've got to know is the acceleration and put, a net, put an m out the front of it. Now, just to be clear, if an object is truly moving in that circle, it may have a dozen forces acting on it. It could have, you know, gravity, a motor, air resistance, but if it truly is moving in that circle at a constant of velocity, then the net force is equal to this here. It doesn't matter what the individual forces are, if it's moving in that circle at a constant, did I say velocity a bit before? In moving in that circle at a constant speed, it must have this net force. Hopefully that's clear. Let's do an example. So we have, I'll blow this up, a skater trying to turn a corner on his skateboard. Starts here and finishes here. 
And this skater has a mass of 80 kilograms. The radius of the turn radius is given by what have I got here? 20 meters. And the skater hopes to be able to turn from here to here at 10 meters a second speed. However, here's the problem. The max force that the board can endure is 300 newtons. If the force is greater than 300 newtons, the board will slip. So let's see, if this skater were to go around this circle, or try to go around this circle, at 10 meters a second, whether the board would slip or not. So we know FC equals MV squared on R. So FC equals MV squared on R, which is equal to 80, that's M. V, that's 10 squared on radius 20, which becomes 80 divided by 20, that's 4 times 100, that's 4 newtons. So if this skater were to trace this path, it would take 400 newtons of centripetal force in order to achieve that. However, we've said the board can only endure 300 newtons, so if we tried to apply that force to the wheels of the board, it would slip. Instead, the skater uh, will say, basically the skater needs this much force to be able to turn that corner but the skater is only getting this much force. So their path is going to look a bit like this. They're, not, they're going to drift out of the turn they wanted. Similar to what a Formula One driver would, uh, would experience if they entered a corner too fast. So the most important things to remember. There are two formulae for centripetal acceleration. If you know the speed or the period and the radius, so either speed and radius or period and radius, you can tell someone exactly what magnitude of acceleration that object is experiencing as it goes around that circle. The formulae are related through that little relationship V equals 4 pi r on, oops sorry, 2 pi r on t. And if you want to turn your centripetal acceleration formulae into a net uh, centripetal force formula. All you've got to do is chuck a little M in front of it and they're very simple to use.